Well, good morning and welcome to a very special Sunday service here at Amford Evangelical Church. My name's Sammy, I'm one of the leaders here and I am thrilled to be able to welcome you along, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube, whatever it is, this Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is the high point in the Christian calendar. It is that annual celebration of all the events that took place so many centuries ago in and around Jerusalem concerning Jesus Christ. Easter Sunday is the celebration of that time when the Eternal Son, who had come in the flesh, who had walked and talked and suffered amongst us, who had died on the Friday, Easter Sunday is the celebration that on the Sunday morning that tomb was empty, Jesus had risen, Jesus was alive. The church at large has for a long time on Easter Sunday such as this declared and celebrated Psalm 118 verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Christ is risen. Those who put their trust in him will rise to new life with him also. His love endures even towards us this day. We're going to sing and I'm going to hand over and leave you in John's capable hands. Lord God, we thank you. We celebrate you. We look to you. We trust in you this great and glorious day. Christ is alive. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Your love endures forever. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. And what a morning it is, Easter Sunday morning. It's true, you know, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. That's how we used to start services um, in the church that I grew up in. I'm saying those words together and reminding ourselves of the most fundamental, most important truth in all of Christian teaching. In fact, in all of human history. It's true that the God of all the world, the God who made us out of the dust of the ground, came down to our world and, and, and became one of us, took on a dusty, fleshy body, and then died a death like ours, except in many ways not like ours, and then rose. He did something that nobody has ever done before or since yet. He rose again in a human body. It's not a metaphor, not just a nice story to try and help you out on a rainy day but a true fact of history, that God has broken into our world and then broken out of death to give us hope for the future. That's what we're gonna be thinking about today, obviously, because it's Easter Sunday. I want you to see two things today, that, that the resurrection brings a new day and that it's a true story. A new day and a true story. Um, but first of all, let me just explain to you why it's the center of everything. It's a little bit like going on holiday. Um, imagine that you were packing the car, ready to go. You've got your tent, Maybe you're going camping, maybe you're not, I don't know. You packed your swimmies, you packed your sunscreen, you packed everything you can possibly think of. It's taken a few days to get ready. You've put it all into the boot of the car, just about managed to fit it in. Slam the boot shut, it's all stayed in. Pack the children in, pack the grandchildren in, packed all the extra stuff in the roof box and you're ready to go. And then you put the key in the ignition and nothing. Oh, what a start to the holiday. So you knock next door. Jim maybe can help you out. He can give you a jump start. And as you open the boot lid, uh, the bonnet lid, you realize there's no engine inside. There's no engine to drive the car. You've had all of your preparations made. Everything is ready, all of it's done. But the most important thing that you need, the engine to pull that car along to get you to wherever you're going, is gone. It's not there. That would be what it's like, just a little hint of what it's like if the resurrection hadn't happened. All of Christianity, you could you could pack it in nice and tidily. It could be the most wonderful, interest, interesting story that you've ever heard. But if the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen, then it's irrelevant. None of it matters. It won't get you anywhere. You can forget all of the questions that you have, all of the objections that you have, all of the strange struggles that you have day by day in prayer, because God isn't really there if the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen. You can forget about ever having answers to your questions because there is really no good God to go to for answers. There's no living God to pray to, to walk with. There's nothing that Christianity promises you unless Jesus is alive, unless this new day that he brings is a true story. It would be like picking up a guitar to play and there being no strings, driving away on holiday with no engine, like trying to boil pasta without any water. It's one of those things, the central thing in human history that if it didn't happen, if it's not true, I don't know what the point of life is anymore. Let's eat, drink, for tomorrow we die, because that's all that there is. But the resurrection happened. It's a true story. We'll get to that in a bit. But let me give you, first of all, reasons why we want it to be true. Reasons why it's such good news that it is true. A new day. Let me read to you. John chapter 20. That's the resurrection account we're going to read this morning. John chapter 20, you can flick it up. We've got these posh new Bibles in church. Uh, we had a, a giving day a few weeks ago and um, people in church gave really generously. And one of the things we were giving towards was new Bibles and they just arrived this week. So I have got my new one out and um, oh, I'm quite enjoying it. It's nice and smooth, quite big print for my fading eyes. But John chapter 20 is where we're going today. Hope you've got it there in front of you now. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. They have no idea what's going on just yet. They've seen or at least heard that Jesus has been brutally murdered. John was there. He's the disciple whom Jesus loved who wrote this story. Mary was there. But Peter wasn't there. And they know that he's dead. They know that he's been laid in this tomb. They know where it is. The guard was set. A stone rolled over the entrance. It's sealed. But imagine what it would be like to go to your loved one's grave and find that he'd been dug up. 
or find that somebody would come and kick down the headstone and strewn the flowers everywhere. It would be a punch in the gut. It would be something awful to add on an already awful experience of losing the person that you love. And that's what Mary is going through. She's seen him die. She's maybe even seen him being laid in that tomb. And she goes to that tomb to who knows what. There's this stone there. Was she going to roll away the stone? I, I don't know what she's thinking. She goes to the tomb early on the first day of the week. And the worst thing you can imagine has happened. Somebody's taken the body carted it off somewhere else. Who could it be? We don't know. She doesn't know. She, the last thing in her mind at the moment is resurrection. All she can see is an empty tomb and she runs back and tells some of the men, Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, who's uh, probably John, who's writing this gospel. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Their hearts are beating. Their lungs are pumping. John's a little bit younger. Peter, the older man, slower man, never great at PE, maybe in school. And John beats him to the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but didn't go in. That's mysterious. If somebody had carted off the body, well, surely they would have not unwrapped it first. That would be an odd thing to do unpacked all the expensive spices and expensive linens and left them in the tomb and just taken his body. What would you do that for? What on earth is going on here? So John bends over, looks in, sees the linen, and then finally Simon Peter, puffing, Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb, dived straight in, just like Peter always does. And he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. He knows there's something going on here, that it isn't just logistics. It's not just that somebody's moved the body somewhere else. But maybe there's a twinkling of remembering that Jesus had actually said quite a few times that he would rise again on the third day. And John believes it. John knows the only explanation for this is that he's alive. But he's still wondering. He still hasn't quite seen the whole picture. Verse 9, they still didn't understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They hadn't seen this coming. John hasn't gone back through scripture and kind of worked out and gone, oh, I know exactly what's going on here. He's still wondering. He's got this burgeoning beginning of belief in his heart that Jesus is alive. But he hasn't put it all together quite yet. That's going to take them quite a while. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. They go their separate ways. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. She's come back at some point and she stands outside the tomb weeping because she's still in darkness. She doesn't believe, she doesn't know. She thinks just somebody's nicked the body of the, the teacher who she loves. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She hadn't even looked in before, just seen the stone rolled away and legged it. She saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. Can you feel the anguish? Can you feel the grief? At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know that, she didn't realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Now, that's not a rude thing that he calls her woman. It's actually quite a courteous thing in their language, just a tricky to translate. But he's like saying miss or something like that. Why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she says, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. You see, Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. It wasn't the tomb that belonged to his family, it belonged to a rich man. Um, and uh, he'd, he'd given it to Jesus to be buried there. And so perhaps she's thinking that the gardener has come along and, you know, they've had this nice burial the night before, but uh, a couple of nights before, but now it's time to move him to somewhere more appropriate, away from this lovely tomb with its rich man's, uh, lovely garden with this rich man's tomb. So see, she's thinking, naturally, if you've moved the body, just let me know so that I can go and bury him somewhere else. She can't see. She has no idea what's going on. She has no idea who she's talking to. Maybe tears have blinded her eyes. And then one of my favourite things in the whole of the Bible, Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. And however he says it, it's in the way that he's always said it. 
and she recognises. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. She goes back to her heart language, her mother tongue. She's at the end of herself. She's wept all the tears that she can. They've blinded her eyes. She has no idea what's going on. She just wants to get his body and honour him and then somehow move on with tomorrow. And all of a sudden, a familiar voice speaks, speaks her name in the way that he'd always said her name. And as he recognises her and speaks her name, she recognises him. She hears his voice, recognises who it is. And, and out from her heart, bubbles in her own heart language, the name that she's always called him, teacher. The one who's taught her everything she ever wanted to know, who'd answered her questions, who'd helped with her doubts, who'd raised her from an old life and brought her to new life somehow, who'd taken her from darkness and into light once, and now he's done it all over again, but in a, in a way more epic way. Everything had come crashing down for Mary, but now he's made everything sad come untrue, and he's there, right there. Teacher, she says. Jesus said, don't hold on to me. Maybe she falls down at his feet and grasps on. Maybe she's just limp, like a limpet on him, giving him a crutch, never wanting him to go away again. And he says, don't hold on to me, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. There's something better yet to come, Mary. There's something better than just having me here physically. There's something that's going to be not just for you, but for the whole of the world, for all of these brothers, and for one day every tribe and tongue and nation. There's something better than just having me back from the dead for a little while. I'm going to rise and ascend to the right hand of God on high. I'm going to rule everything. The kingdom is finally going to come once and for all, fully. And it's going to be even better than having me here in the garden. You're going to have the Holy Spirit. That's what I think he's pointing towards. You can go back and read about that. Chapter 14, 15, 16, 17. Jesus promising the disciples he's going to send the Comforter, the one who'd come and make him and the Father present with us forever, even while we don't see him. Better days are coming, Mary. So don't touch me, don't hold on to me now as if I'm about to slip away again. Run back and tell those disciples that I'm alive. That, that your Father is God. My father is yours. Everything I have is yours and everything that you have is mine. We belong to each other and we will for eternity. So Mary Magdalene went back to the disciples with the good news. I have seen the Lord, not just the empty tomb, not just a mystery, not just some weird cloths folded up, but I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. It's an epic story, isn't it? An amazing story of darkness that's turned into light of death that, that bears fruit in life, of sin that gets washed away and, and, and becomes brightness. It's a story about loneliness that's turned into family. It's a story about being far away from God, full of tears, sunk in darkness, but lifted up and brought home to him, to the one who dries our tears. That's what this new day is. I wonder if you saw those hints um, of it through the story. Early on the first day of the week, John, in his whole story, loves to play with the themes of light and darkness. They've been there right from the beginning. In fact, if you want a little fun activity on your um, Easter Sunday afternoon while your lamb dinner is going down or if you've had a bit too much chocolate, go back and read John chapter 1, the first um, 14, 15 verses, and see if you can see any of the, the things that he introduces right at the beginning unpacked here in chapter 20. Go and do that this afternoon. But one of the big ones, and the obvious, obvious ones, is darkness and light. We walk in darkness, but the people walking in darkness, as Isaiah said, have seen a great light. John says the, the life, the light of all of the world is coming into this darkness. The people walking in darkness had no idea about him, but he came to make them children of God. He came to bring them life and light. And you can see that in this story, can't you? That God who's come close, God who's come in flesh, has come, has come back from the dead for a new day, for a new beginning. So we've got to work this out, which days of the week um, we're talking about here. So Jesus died on the Friday, um, the last day of the week before, well, the last day of working, of the working week in the Jewish calendar. And what 
the next day was, was the Sabbath day, the day of rest. So Jesus dies on the Friday, the last day where you finish your work. And in John's gospel, the last thing you hear him say is, it is finished. And then he, it's as if he's resting in the tomb. His work's done. It's all over. He takes a sigh of relief and he has a nap, has a rest on Saturday, the Sabbath day. And then this day, which we call Sunday, we often think of it as our kind of last day of the week, um, our rest day at the end of the working week, on Sunday would actually be the first day of a new week for the Jewish people. It's the equivalent of their Monday. Um, it's the day when a new chapter starts, a new day begins, and the world has been brought to a new chapter. Can you see that? Jesus dies on the Friday, rests on the Saturday, and this is the first day of a new week, the first day of a new world. A new day has dawned. Literally, Mary's there at break of day. And there's lots of light in the story, isn't there? There's darkness, there's, there's misunderstanding, there's what's going on here. And then as they see the linens folded up and tidily put in their places, John has light dawn into his heart and he believes. And believing is tied up with life in John's gospel. I'll maybe read you one of those verses later on. Or Mary, she's in darkness when she's standing outside of the tomb in verse 11, weeping. And then she looks in and there's two angels dressed in bright clothing. There's light beginning to dawn into her own personal darkness. And then she comes out and there's darkness in that she can't recognise Jesus. She can't see him through tears or there's something about him that is just different, is changed. And then he says her name and light dawns. She recognises. The light of recognition comes into her eyes, into her heart, into her soul, and she sees do you see that? It's a new day. It's a new beginning. Let me give you four things. We've mentioned a few of them already, but four things just to um, pin down. Four new things that happen. Because when a new day begins, it means the old day is over. When a new chapter begins, that means the first chapter is closed and finished. And we're moving on to the new thing. So what's gone in this new day? What's gone is death. At least it's a beginning of the end of death. Death has been a brutal and final inescapable reality until now. People just don't come back from the dead, at least not for very long. It happened a couple of times in the Old Testament, Elijah, um, Elisha, and then a couple of times with Jesus in the Gospels, he's brought people back from the dead, like Lazarus, you might know that story, it's earlier in John's Gospel, chapter 11, brings people back from the dead, but they always die again sometime later. This is the first time ever that somebody has come back in a new human body that's light and bright and clothed in immortality that's indestructible mary doesn't quite seem to get that she's gripping onto jesus almost as if she could lose him again but you can never lose him again because he's been raised in a resurrection body paul talks about that 1 corinthians 15 if you want to go and read that this afternoon a resurrection body that's new that's not just a resuscitated human dusty mortal thing that's given a few more years to live. No, this is a new kind of human life, but it's physical. It's real. It's more real than anything in these shadow lands that we live in. Jesus' body is so real, he's able to walk through locked doors, not because he's like a, a ghost, but because the door is like a ghost. This world is fading, and he belongs to the next chapter, to the new day, to immortality that's more solid than anything we've ever, ever experienced. But there's recognition. Do you see that? There's humanness. There's love. He says her name and she recognises his voice and recognises him. Later on, he'll cook fish for the disciples. Later on, he'll show himself to hundreds of people at the same time. It's not an illusion. It's not a ghost. It's not some psychological event. It really happened. He was there in a body and that means that death is dead. Or at least it's on its way out. That there's nothing to fear. If you're holding on to Jesus, well, really, if he's holding on to you, then you'll be safe through death and out the other side. When you fall asleep in death, it really will just be like sleep. You'll wake up again one day in a new body, just like Jesus is. If you're trusting in him, well, then he has you held. Death is dead. Love has won. Christ is conquered, as one of our songs goes. So it's a new day. That means the end of death, life has come. It's a new day. That means the end of tears, right? There's so many tears in this story. Two times the angels say, and then Jesus says, woman, why are you crying? They're so gentle with her, aren't they? Except it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a gentle rebuke. They say, don't you realise what's happened? This is not a time for crying anymore. Do you realise the hope that you have? Don't you realise that grief, 
that grief is going to come to an end and that there's going to be joy in this new day. And she has joy like you just can't imagine. Maybe we can try and imagine it this afternoon. Somebody that you loved, just hearing their voice again. Not on that um, voicemail message that you might have kept just to listen to their voice. Not on that uh, family video that you might get out and enjoy in that kind of excruciating way when you remember people who've gone or memories passed. But you actually hear their voice alive from their own voice box with their own lungs, with their own... Wouldn't that be amazing? Her tears of grief get turned into tears of joy. And it's a, it's a new day, something that no human being has ever experienced quite like it before. Death is turned to life. Tears are turned to joy. Sin. There doesn't seem to be much mention of sin here, but if you just think back to the last thing that Jesus said, he said it was finished. When he died on the cross, he said it was finished. What was finished? His work. His work of cleaning up sin. His work of dying instead of us. His work of bringing us close to the Father, of bridging the gap between us and God. His work of taking all of our failures and disasters and betrayals of God and dying with them, putting them, burying them in a hole in the ground. It was finished, it was done. The sentence of death was passed. And how do you know that that was definitely finished? Well, he came to life again. It's as if the debt was paid. It's as if the sentence was finished and Jesus walks free from the prison of death and says it really is finished, you know. All that sin, all that darkness, all that you've ever done, that you've been disappointed with, it's washed away. It's clean. You're a new person now. A new day has dawned. You don't have to be bugged by that old master sin anymore. You don't have to give in to it. Temptation doesn't have to be the story of your life anymore. You can be free from it for a new day, walking with Jesus hand in hand. Death turns to life in this new day. Tears turn to joy. Sin turns to cleanness and newness and holiness. And the last one, loneliness turns to belonging. I wonder if you saw that. Did you hear the message Jesus gives Mary to send back to the disciples, to the brothers? He calls them brothers. And he says, my father is your father. My God is your God. In John's gospel up until now, he's, he's talked about God as um as like our God, uh, not, as, not as our God, but as kind of the God or as my father uh, or as the father. But it's never been your father just yet. This is quite an amazing thing where Jesus says something has happened in his death and in his resurrection and this new life that he has now. This new day means you can come close to God. You belong in his family. Whatever you've done, whoever you are, whatever they did to you, whatever your experience of church in the past, Maybe that's what's keeping you at home today, just not really wanting to come and be with God's people because of how you've been treated before. Well, did you know that loneliness can be over, that you belong with God's people and we belong to each other because we belong to him and he belongs to us. It's a really important theme in the whole of the Bible, from God walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day right at the beginning, to promising to be their God and walking with them as the freed people from Egypt to promising new hearts where we'll know him for ourselves in Jeremiah or in Ezekiel in those old strange prophets to this day where Jesus looks at Mary and he says, Mary, this isn't just about me and you. This is about us. This is about the world. This is about a table, about a family, about a mansion where you belong, where there's a place for you at my table, around the table of the king, with God as your father. Do you belong to him? Do you believe in all of this? Do you trust it? Or maybe you're a little bit still like Mary in the garden, a little bit unsure. You think maybe Jesus might be there somewhere, but if he is, he's awfully distant. Maybe you just can't quite see him yet. Maybe it's grief and suffering that is really making it difficult for you to believe that there even could be a God. Uh, maybe you just haven't thought about it that much. Maybe you think it's crazy and ridiculous to believe that somebody rose from the dead. I don't know. But are you a bit like Mary here, with Jesus standing here, saying that he's in our world, that he's around us all the time by his spirit, but you just can't quite see it? Well, one thing we could do is to pray that he would make himself real to us. Um, but we might need some reasons to believe that it's real as well. So we've thought about it being a new day. Let me tell you, it's a true story. I wonder if you spotted 
any little clues to that as we went through the story. Clues that show this is eyewitness testimony. John's gospel was written within the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses. We have a little um, portion of it in, it's called the Rylands Papyrus in the library, the Rylands Library in um, Trinity College in Dublin. I think that's where it is at the moment. Rylands Papyrus. If you ever go to Dublin, you could nip in and see it. There's probably going to be a bit of a queue. It's kind of famous thing and a famous museum in a lovely part of Dublin. Um, you could go see it if you want to, but it's a, a little piece of the manuscript of John's gospel that goes right back right back to the first century, right back to within a century of Jesus walking and talking and rising again to the time when people who would have been there, who would have been eyewitnesses, who would have known Mary Magdalene and the disciple Jesus loved and Simon Peter and all the people who are mentioned here. And in the other parts of the Gospels, um, there's a great bit in Mark's Gospel where Jesus, when he's, when he's being forced to carry the cross up Golgotha, on his final journey, he can't do it. He falls over with exhaustion. And so the, disciple, the, the soldiers force a man called Simon of Cyrene to carry Jesus's cross up the hill, that last bit of the journey. And in Mark's account of, of that uh, story, he doesn't just say it was Simon of Cyrene who did this, but he said, oh, Simon of Cyrene, who's the father of Rufus. And I can't remember the name of the other guy, but he names the sons of Simon of Cyrene. You can go look it up in Mark's gospel. What are those names there for? Well, they're little footnotes so that people who were there at the time, within the lifetimes of these eyewitnesses, when these documents were written and finalised and published publicly, widely, you could go and find Rufus and the other brother and ask them, was it true? Did your, did your dad really carry Jesus' cross up that hill? You could go and find Mary Magdalene or maybe find her children or Simon Peter. We know he definitely had some children. Um, you could go and find these people and look them in the eye and say, did it really happen? Did you, did you really see him in that garden? You could look them in the eye. And there's plenty of, of reasons for us who can't look them in the eye right now to believe that it's eyewitness evidence too. Did you see all the details in here? That John, who's writing the story, the disciple whom Jesus loved, tells you who got to the tomb first. And that when he got to the tomb first, by the way, he beat Peter there, just a little athletic achievement for you. Um, he didn't go in. He looked in, but he didn't go in. And then Peter came and dives it straight into the tomb. And he sees the linens. And the really interesting detail about the linens, the body ones wrapped and folded in their place and the head one wrapped and folded in its place separately. Why would you include those little details? They don't necessarily matter for the story. Why would you include them unless... You were actually there and saw them. Little details of them being eyewitness accounts. But okay, all right, maybe somebody just wrote an interesting story that they were trying to make sound true, trying to make sound like a believable story. Well, um, let me give you C.S. Lewis's verdict on that kind of idea. C.S. Lewis, who was a professor of literature, he said this, I've been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legends and myths all my life. I know what they are like. I know none of them are quite like this. He's talking about the Gospels. Of this text, there are only two possible views. Either this is reportage, as an eyewitness account that you wrote down because it happened. Either this is reportage or else some unknown writer without known predecessors or successors suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern, re novelistic, realistic narrative. The reader who doesn't see this has simply not learned how to read. C.S. Lewis says it's only in the last couple of centuries that people have started writing in the way that our modern novels are written, with kind of little interesting details that you put in to make it sound real. They did, simply didn't write like that in the ancient world. So what on earth is going on here? Either it's some literary genius who's come up with a whole new way of writing that wasn't rediscovered or revisited again until, <laughs> until a few centuries ago, or they're just writing what they saw. These documents are really early. And they really have the ring of eyewitness evidence. But okay, maybe they were made up. Maybe there were other reasons that you can think of for Jesus' body not being in the tomb. Maybe the disciples stole the body and took it away for some reason. But you can think that through. No, there was a guard in front of the tomb. There was a massive stone that had been sealed in front of the tomb. And there's no evidence of them being bold enough to go and hatch a plot to say that he was risen from the dead because none of them even expected him to rise from the dead. It wasn't even an idea that crossed their minds. Like John and Peter here, they, it, they begin to twig, 
But it's not as if they've been waiting outside the tomb at six o'clock on, on Monday morning saying, here we go, let's get ready. The tomb's about to be opened so that he can rise again. Nobody's waiting for it. Mary's there in tears, even after the tomb's been opened, because it just doesn't cross their minds that he's risen again. It just doesn't cross their minds. It really didn't, doesn't seem like a plot. And even if it was a plot, even if they've cleverly written this to make it sound like they never expected it, but actually they did steal and hide the body, somehow getting through the Roman guard and rolling the tomb away and hiding the body forever. Do you know what happened to the disciples? Almost every single one of those first 11 disciples left over were killed for their faith, were martyred, went to their deaths, insisting that they saw him, that it happened. People like Peter, who literally a couple of hours before this had told as many people as would listen that he didn't even know Jesus. He was so terrified Peter eventually, years later, goes to his death saying, I saw it. He rose again. It's true. It happened. There's plenty of people who die for things that are nonsense because they're misguided. But I don't know of anybody who would die for something that they know to be a lie, that they know is complete nonsense. What would be, what's in it for the disciples? They didn't get riches or much power at all. They got hardship and difficulty. They got laughed at and then they got killed. There was really nothing in it for them to tell people that Jesus rose from the dead other than that it, ha- that it happened. It's pretty much the only logical, reasonable ed- explanation for it. Can I give you another reason to believe that it has happened? The women were the first ones at the tomb. That's something that maybe we just take for granted. You've heard this story before. But in this first century context, it would have been a really strange thing to write a story where women were the first witnesses to something extremely important, to the most important thing in your whole religion. Why? Because women's um, testimony wasn't admissible in court. Or if it was, it certainly didn't carry the weight of the men's testimony. It was kind of embarrassing to ask a woman to come in and give their testimony. It wouldn't really do your case any favours. So if you were making up this story, for whatever reason you're making it up, why would you write women in as the first witnesses? That would put lots of holes in your story. It would puncture its credibility in the eyes of the people who were, who you're trying to convince in this first century. The only reason that you would possibly write that in, that you would write the story like this, is if you had no choice, because that's how it happened. I'm sorry, ladies, that is a bit of a harsh thing, isn't it? Um, but that's what it was like in these days. And it's a really good piece of evidence that these stories are actually true, that they're writing down things that that they believe to have happened in this way because that's just how they happened, because they were there and that's who was there. And this is what they saw. Last thing, could you explain the rise of the early church without the resurrection of Jesus? That all these Jewish people who believe that God could never possibly become man, that you should never worship anything in this creation, that people, thousands of Jewish people, began to believe something that would have been blasphemous to them to worship a man to worship a human being as god is something completely out of the imagination of jewish people something utterly blasphemous and ridiculous something that got plenty of the early christians um, hunted down and killed by people like the apostle paul before he became the apostle so what on earth was it that persuaded all these people who thought that idea would be blasphemous to worship to start worshiping jesus what was it Well, they must have seen him. They must have seen Jesus rise from the dead. Um, I don't know if that's persuaded you. I don't know if it's given you some extra things to think about. Um, But I hope it's been a start to help you to see that this isn't just a myth. That this isn't something that was kind of added on to the Christian story centuries and centuries later. That this is what people believed and wrote down in the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses against all of the odds for kind of persuading people to believe them that it got them in a lot of trouble, that it didn't win them riches and fame and uh, fortune and power. It got them a lot of suffering and trouble and laughter often. This is a story that I think only has one explanation, that it really happened, that Jesus actually rose from the dead, that they were there, Mary, the disciple Jesus loved, Simon Peter, the other disciples in the room later on, the other disciples on the beach later on, the hundreds of others who saw him, they were there and they saw him in a body, indestructible. A body that had brought a new day because of the resurrection. Death was gone. Life is what we have to look forward to. Tears have been
been turned into joy. Sin is gone forever, dealt with, no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And now, if you are lonely, you belong. If you felt far away from God, well, he's brought you close. If you feel like nobody wants you, well, he loves you. If you are afraid of death and all that it holds, don't be. Jesus has two questions for us as we finish. Two questions that he asks Mary. Why are you crying? Have you got griefs and suffering and struggle in your life? Don't you realise the hope that you have in Jesus? Come and know him. Come and find him. Why are you crying? There really is hope for this world. Hope for your body. Hope for your family. Hope for your life beyond the grave. Real, solid, human hope. Why are you crying? Question two, who is it you're looking for? Is it just a teacher to give you a few tips so you can crack on and live your life the way that you want to live it? Are you living for yourself still? Just looking for Jesus to give you some tips as a teacher or will you come and find him? Will you come and look for him as the king of all the world who's defeated that last enemy death? Will you come and find him as the gentle one who will wipe away every tear? Will you come and find him as your saviour who will wash away your sins? Will you come and find him as the one who wraps his arms around you and makes you belong in his family forever? Will you come and seek Jesus and find him today? Because he's alive, you know. So let's pray to him. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are alive. We thank you that there's hope in death. We thank you that sin is gone. We thank you that tears can be wiped away, that our grief now will only last for a while, but joy will come in the morning. And Lord, we thank you that we belong now with you. Help us to trust you. Lord, help us to look to you. Help us to come and seek you, not just as a teacher, not just as some figure of history, not just as some myth to get us through a dark night, but Lord, help us to come and seek you while you may be found, to seek you as the living one, the risen one, the king of all, the saviour, the Lord, raised to life again. Lord, thank you for that good news. Thank you that it's true news and ask that you would help us to trust you, to live in this truth and walk with you all of our days, we pray. Amen. i
early. While the night still lingered, the world was different. The light that had come was extinguished, and all that remained was sorrows. What could have been? And yet, as those first disciples approached the place of sorrow, the world was different. Slowly, softly, the sun began to rise. The light that had come was to be seen again. Jesus, you died, and they sealed you in the earth. But three days later, you rose again, defeating death and bringing life. Mary, you called her by name. Thomas, you invited that doubter. Peter, you commissioned that coward. Oh, how that light still shines. Oh, how our world remains forever changed. Oh, how you speak to us, invite us and commission us to hear of, live in, and carry your kingdom come. We know the details. We ask that our lives would exhibit the effects. We rehearse the story. We ask that our lives would manifest its truth. As the sun rose on that first Easter, the world was changed forever. Lord, change us forever. Make us each day to live in the world that Jesus has remade.